It was the time when the sun beat down on a parched land. On the waves of the ocean, great sea changes. They were the days of hardship to the people. Cross at your peril. <laughs> oh, yes, please. Gimme, gimme, gimme. Good afternoon, welcome to Scrum 5, the rugby programme with a new approach. The game has changed and so have we. Scrum 5, a fresh start. The best of the game in Wales alongside and decide for yourselves how good we are. The very best from the Southern Hemisphere. Scrum 5 then, it's all new, well apart from us two. Uh, Eddie, by the way, was that you diving in? As if, it? Alan, as if. Come on, let's just say what's on the programme. Stand by for a couple of belters. First last season, first outing this season. Heineken League champions, Cardiff. Pumped up Pondefreeze, they reckon it's their turn. From South Wales to the Southern Hemisphere, New Zealand's champions and pretenders. After the World Cup failure, South Africa revisited. Some home truths to ponder. And the man who launched the brave new world. Rugby will become an open game. There will be no provision on payment or the provision of other material benefit to any person involved in the game. And talking tactics the Triorki way, our analyst, Clive Jones. No tougher start then for Cardiff, as if they hadn't had enough uh, Pontypridd all last season. Here they were again at the Arms Park, head to head. Neither team at full strength. The commentary will come to you from Hugh Twillin Davis. First, the teams. Our key is uh, the, the half-back, I think, and if we can get some possession for them, they, they can dictate a game, and hopefully Neil will uh, run matters, and uh, we can spread it wide. We've got, uh, like, Spy Manley on the wing, and Kerry Thomas, who are not no slouches, so we'll be looking to move it wide. Up front, usually, we take the lead of Dale and uh, Phil John, so if they have good games, usually it gets the rest of us going. Um, obviously, with Greg out today, we'll be looking for a big, big game from Mark Rowley. Well, it's going to be tough for us. Uh, we've got a lot of players out, but uh, you know we'll be very competitive. And uh, being on our home ground, uh, it's vital for us to win. You know, the back row is very strong. Although we don't have height there, it is very strong. And, and certainly, the front row is an international front row. So. Uh, you know, uh, we'll be competitive in certain areas, but hopefully the injuries will hold up and, and we can go forward. So it's the start of the new professional era here at a club steeped in the old traditions and a stern challenge for a below-strength Cardiff as they attempt to become the first side to successfully defend the Heineken League title. The day's top game deserves a top referee. 
We have that in Clayton Thomas from the Welsh international panel. First kick goes to Dale McIntosh. Cardiff's first touch as Heineken champions. Adrian Davis gathers, but offside as Pontypridd won the wreck on their own 22. Pontypridd, who did start last Saturday, they gambled without Jenkins, John and Greg Prosser and beat Ebu Vale and gained four points under the new points awarded for try scoring this season. Here's Neil Jenkins, a week ago against the world champions. This week against the champions of the Heineken League. John Humphreys, number two. I wonder if he's still pinching himself at times, how the wheels of fortune have turned in 12 months. A year ago, fighting to establish himself as number one hooker at Cardiff Arms Park. And now the new Welsh captain. He's in there at the heart of the drive. Lyndon Musto takes it on further. Good concerted effort by the Cardiff pack. And now the young prop, Andrew Lewis, lends his weight. Clayton Thomas was about to play advantage. Cardiff won the ball, but the referee still blew. Booth is ready to move the ball, but Hemi Taylor calls up the kicker. Adrian Davis is at the outside half for Cardiff. Second highest point scorer in the league last season, but still the first kick goes to Chris John. That is why straight and true. And Cardiff, after four and a half minutes, are ahead by three points to nil. Phil John. And the line-out work by both sides so far, exemplary. Wakeford three times for Cardiff, now Mark Rowley for Pontypridd. It was Steve Lewis who took the short pass from Neil Jenkins. It's back with Jenkins. Thrown down by the mobile prop, Andrew Lewis. Pontypridd, 10 metre line. Musto, Vince Davis. Two former Pontypool forwards. Now combining for Cardiff. In fighting for the ball is number 14. Right wing Steve Ford with Cardiff. And Clayton Thomas finally loses patience and penalises Pontypridd for holding on to that ball. Chris John. Once again, strikes it well, for the second time, successful. Eight minutes gone, Cardiff lead, six points to nil. Booth did well, Taylor, Bennett, good work by Cardiff, this is Simon Hill. He's got pace, as you'd expect from an international winger. Good, firm tackle by Crispin Cormack, and perhaps Simon Hill will look back and think he might have passed, but it's still on for Cardiff. Adrian Davis, Davis back inside, Mark Ring, back to Steve Ford, Ford crosses the line. A marvellous Cardiff try, swept the length of the field. And it's taken them just 11 minutes this season to achieve what they failed to achieve in two games against Pontypridd in the league last year. That is to get to the try line. And Steve Ford is the man who got it. Such confidence in the Cardiff ranks, moving the ball, untidy ball initially from the line out way back in their own 22. It was halted, but only temporarily. As all Cardiff swarmed to that ball, just the one lone defender, ring not quite the legs to get there, but the presence of mind to release the man in space, and that man was Steve Ford. Chris John maintains his 100% record and Cardiff are scoring at a rate of more than a point a minute. They're 13 points ahead after 12 minutes.
McIntosh out to John. John does well. The little kick through. It could be a chance for Manley. Oh, he's done well. It's a try for Conte Fred. He had to halt together, but was still elusive enough to beat the Cardiff defence and get Conte Fred's first try at the arms park. 26 minutes. It's 16 points to eight. Paul John with the initial thrust, well-placed kick. Now, the bounce wasn't the kindest, but uh, Cardiff's defence was three men allowed Manley to escape. And even the right winger must have been surprised with the ease of the try in the end. John escapes Hemi Taylor. Crispin Cormack causes a distraction. And there, Owen Thomas misses Manley. He's between the other two defenders. And that's a boost for Pontypridd. <laughs> Neil Jenkins converts and Pontypridd are right back in the game. <laughs> Dale McIntosh has come to stand number two for Pontypridd. That's to give Mark Rowley more room and more freedom to jump at the back. And now McIntosh comes around, makes inroads into that Cardiff defence. That should be a penalty for Pontypridd. Clayton Thomas plays advantage. Paul John tries to take it. But as he loses the ball, they'll come back. And this time, it will be a penalty in front of the posts. Now, a genuine chance this time for Neil Jenkins. Two out of four so far at the posts. Now it's three out of five, and Cardiff's lead, once 13 points, is down to three. It's 16-13 after 32 minutes. Mark Spiller is the replacement for Dale McIntosh. Hemi Taylor and his pack for the fifth time. Trying to apply the pressure on the Ponte Prix eight. Once again, they go for the pushover, and this time, Clayton Thomas loses patience, goes under the posts, it's a penalty try. And Pontefield had to yield under the pressure, and Bazzani knows it. It's Cardiff 21, Pontefield 13. It's not an entertaining way to gain points, but there's the pressure applied, Nigel Bazzani, well, I wonder whether he could have stayed on his feet. But the whole pack crumbles, and this time, Clayton Thomas decides it's intentional. Cardiff were denied. A simple task for Chris John. He hasn't failed all half, so it's a ten-point lead once again. Cardiff 23, Potipri 13. <laughs> Forty minutes gone at the end of the first half. And once again, Pontefrith are defending. It's been Cardiff's half, it's reflected in the score. 23-13, they lead. That's the whistle for half-time. Interesting, at times entertaining. And Cardiff rightly lead, 23 points to 13. Kerry Thomas, Pontefrith left wing, leaving at half time. The replacement is Gavin Jones. <laughs> Cormac on halfway. A tall man for a fullback, six foot three. I suppose it helps under the high ball. He gets to it quicker. Initially, won a pillar of strength for Pontefrith in the middle of the line. 
taking the ball for the sixth time cleanly in the game. And that's allowed this drive by his fellow forwards. A determined one. And it could be productive as well as the ball comes back now to James Alvis. He's well held, but it's a penalty for Pontefried. That's against Cardiff for pulling the rack down or pulling the ball down. And I think that Nigel Bazzani was quietly inquiring there whether it might have been a chance of a penalty try. But <laughs> Clayton Thomas would have had none of that. Interesting point of discussion as we uh, watch Neil Jenkins' lengthy preparations. Now, it states in law that 40 seconds is the maximum allowed for a kicker from the time that he indicates he's going for goal to the time that he runs up and kicks. So far this afternoon, we've timed uh, Neil Jenkins an average of a minute. And again, it states in law that that is outside the time that should be allowed. Jenkins, it creeps inside the posts. It was time successfully spent this time because Pontefriath have their first points of the second half. They're up to 23-16 now after 10 minutes. Quick ball, good to see. And Captain Taylor tries to make use of it. Now on the charge, Andrew Lewis, a prop in the modern mould, loves to have the ball in his hands, as does Mark Bennett. A chance as Adrian Davis tries to release Ford. Ford could get there for his second try. It's the third for Cardiff. So it's their first ever bonus point for try scoring in the Heineken League. To remind you, it's one bonus point for three or four tries. It's two for five of six. And it's three for seven or more. So as they open their campaign, Cardiff, who failed to score one try against Pontefriath in two games last year, have now had three, two for four, and a penalty try, and a bonus point to boot. Taylor. It seems as if he is going to open his campaign as the new club captain of Cardiff with a victory. Storming on once again are the Cardiff forwards. They've been dominant this afternoon and the backs have enjoyed the freedom to run Steve Ford against the replacement Nicky Lloyd. Ever elusive Steve Ford. They've turned him. He's over for the hat trick. A wide smile of satisfaction and delight. Also from some of the walking wounded of the Cardiff squad who watch. Steve Ford had 19 tries last year in the Heineken League. He was the leading scorer for Cardiff. And Mark Rowley helped him on his way. Mark Ring has left the field. Simon Davis is on. Rowley again. The one good source of possession for Pontefriath in the lineout. But the usual fire is not quite there from the Sardis Road Club. Trundling forward. Lots of whistle from Clayton Thomas, very often for the same offences. This time, once again, it's for pulling down the mall. Ten minutes remain. Paul John chooses his man. The man is the captain, Bazzani. Flowed immediately, but the ball is there for Paul John. Once again, the penalty for impeding the man. Phil John takes it quickly, right on the line. Turning, twisting, and the try is awarded. Scrum half, Paul John comes up with the ball. But the pre-second try, if they could get there once again, 
they'd be back in the game and they'd be the consolation of a bonus try a uh, bonus point for tries it's the Johns in concert hooker Phil within an inch or two of getting the try himself scrum half Paul does so John sweeps it out to Simon Enoch at centre. And here's a chance for Pontepri. It's 3 to 2. If they can work it out, Nicky Lloyd. Lloyd. Steve Ford stays with him, but inside is Paul John. The scrum half gets his second try. And slightly lax Cardiff defence allows Pontepri to come back. It's 36 29. And an easy conversion to come. Well, three minutes left, and the battle that seemed over is still alive. Nicky Lloyd has made quite an impression since coming on as a replacement. Did well to keep it alive. John did well to support, and that's his second try. Neil Jenkins. That's straight and true. It dead. Clayton Thomas blows the final whistle. It will be a great boost for Hemi Taylor and his side. They've beaten the runners up last year, Pontefree, by 36 points to 31. It was nice to see both sides trying to play rugby, which I think the last four or five times we played against each other, it's been a bit of a dour affair. But it's good to see straight from the start both sides trying to spin the ball. I think the crowd enjoyed it. Very unusual for uh, Cardiff on the games, but we both said, uh, you know, myself, Paul and uh, John in uh, South Africa, that we're going to try and make it as open as possible. And, uh, you know, what the spectators are paying for, let's, you know, let's give a bit of open rugby. And like, well, like I think we proved today that we're uh, sitting in for honours again at the end of the season. I mean, I know it's a long way to go, you know, and there's a lot of hurdles to uh, sort of get over. But uh, got a good side out today, and uh, we'd be more than happy with our performance today. To win a championship, all the cap is based on the squad. You know, we've had injury problems, and so are other sides along the way. But those who overcome the injury problems are the ones who succeed at the end of the day. The first grumbles of the season aimed at the referee. Some things never change. David Lloyd with the interception for Triorchi, but all the play to no avail. Everything disallowed, and Swansea eventually awarded a penalty back at the interception. Triorchi leading 6-3 at half-time and continuing to drive on and drive on. Their only reward two more penalties for Lloyd, four in all for the centre. Swansea's performance leaving coach Mike Ruddock only reasonably satisfied, but their try at least came with class, the outstanding Stuart Davis. And coming up, the neatest of reverse flicks from Roddy Bubia to Simon Davis, leaving Triorchi only with their grumbles. I wasn't very happy with a lot of decisions. Um, it seemed to go 90% Swansea's way. Um, the crowd weren't happy, but I was playing, I couldn't see every decision, so the referees is fine. New strip and new faces for the new season at Stradley Park. Matthew McCarthy kicking 15 points on his debut. Fullback Justin Thomas celebrating his first division bow a week after his first Welsh cap with his try. It was Abbott's misfortune to meet Clinetley on the first day out. A scarlet crowd and coach Gareth Jenkins back with the family. This was Clinetley strutting their stuff. Thomas again and Paul Jones touched down for the second of five tries that earned an athlete two bonus points. An athlete dominated the second half, Robin McBride pushing his weight around for McCarthy to put centre Neil Boobia clear. A display that earned the Jenkins stamp of approval. It's nice to be home. Uh, it couldn't have been a better day for it. Uh, it was a well-supported game as well. We had a good, good home crowd here, and um, we've seen some good rugby. I, I was very pleased today. 
Sunshine on the Port Talbot Riviera and touches of brilliance. The Gen Scrum half, Robert Howley, and a series of passes all backwards until Matthew Lewis to Gwilym Wilkins with one looking a touch forwards. Try awarded. Jason Foster taking on the Aberavon defence. Nigel Spender with the more heavyweight finish. 12-6 to Bridge End at half time. Chris Bradshaw with the break. And his long pass to Jamie Reynolds. Not much going right for Aberavon. Interception and try for Gwilym Wilkins. I would have settled for five tries before coming here today, but uh, I think what you're trying to do is we should have scored a few more. Uh, that, that could be one reason for disappointment, but having said that, if we win every game by five tries this year, I won't be unhappy. Two games, two defeats. It's going to be a long, very long, hard season ahead of you. Well, I won't say that, you know, uh, you know, it's, I'd say uh, give us a couple of months, get together, get this unit, play as a, as a, as a team, not individually, and I will surprise quite a few people. Not too despondent, that? Never despondent, never. Remember those great Neath days when points and tries records were broken with a style of rugby envied countrywide? One of their old boys, Lynn Jones, is the club's new coach. His promise is to make it happen again. At Ebervale, glimpses of what might be Mike Morgan's try, but the coach not entirely happy. I was, I was a little disappointed, uh, especially first half. Uh, Ebervale tend to come over the, bottom, over the top and come into the side of the racks <clears throat> after what, what happened in the World Cup. We've been, we've been working on, on what happened in the World Cup, you know, being positive and not giving penalties away at those areas, which is quite cancerous in, in Welsh rugby. We were disappointed that they, 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 they were ill-disciplined there and were uh, rewarded for it by not getting penalised. They look to set up malls and slow it, you know. We, obviously then, if they're looking to sit in and settle and set up a mall to drive, we have obviously got to look to disrupt it, whether it be knock it back or whether it be bite your tongue and drop it, maybe. Gwent Derby. Guess how many bonus points for tries scored here. Penalty by Newport's Gareth Rees. Ex-shot putter, Canada's outside half. And another. 9-7 to Newport at half-time. Newbridge in the second half with a gem of a try. Scrum half Richard Williams. Wing Steve Reid. And Matthew Silver back in Union after playing rugby league. From the Halifax Pro to the Eton Schoolmaster. A game of two very different halves for us, I think. Uh, the first half, we, we tried to run as they were in it. With the line-out dominance we have this year, or uh, potential dominance, we, uh, we should be playing a bit tighter game, so we tighten it up a bit in the second half. But uh, we're, we're a quietly exciting side. We can, we can run around the fringes. Uh, and uh, I was happy with the guys that they played. The forwards were very tough and uh, got effectively a pushover when it counted, and that, that was great to see. And uh, we've got a lot of things to work on, but uh, it's a great result away from home. It's hard to win up here, we know that. How about a new number 10 to brighten up English club rugby? Leicester have one, but he's Irish, Niall Malone, and only occasional adventure in front of 14,000 at Welford Road against promoted Saracens. Surge by centre Stuart Potter. And Rory Underwood squeezing over for one of Leicester's three tries. At Gloucester, events on the field not as exciting as matters off. Gloucester's Tim Smith, but this was the tale of an expansive outside half who wasn't playing and who's Welsh. Paul Turner off the bench to do a mini cantona on a fan. The player coach back to enjoy Severi Muto's winning try. And Oral's expansive game needs a bit of refining too. Harlequins with David Pears, injury prone, but still the most likely number 10 in England to open things up, taking advantage. Will Darling to hook a replacement for the injured Brian Moore, Simon Mitchell. The Courage League, all right in small doses, as Will Carling used to say in his amateur days when he could pick and choose his games. But now to something that's great in huge chunks, the National Provincial Championship of New Zealand. Otago, from way down in the South Island, in their fortress of Carisbrook in Dunedin. Carisbrook, all-black test stadium, one of the citadels of rugby union. From the top of the North Island, against Otago, come the champions, Auckland. 
And the home team coming out in the blue and gold. We join play in the 11th minute. Auckland 3-0 in front after an Adrian Cashmore penalty. Commentator at Carisbrook, Keith Quinn. Oliver throws. Joseph and Tane Randall going high. John Leslie. Forster. Well done, Otago. Out to Randall, last week's attacking number eight forward. A great run. Bishop. A great try for Bishop. But once again, big thanks from the crowd to number eight, Tane Randall. Look at it again, a lovely run by Randall. This is the way he probed in that uh, try to Paul Cook uh, last week and the one he scored himself against Wellington. The pass just delayed it a wee bit, gave it to Bashup, momentum running, the tacklers came in, but Bashup was over. Tonu'u, a little delay and takes it up near the 22. Auckland's backs are keen to have it, and they have it now from a good pass by Chandler. And it's out to a Ronnie Clark. 22 meter line there. Pretty good Auckland pack that's here today. Tonu'u, Spencer. That's Mika, Dylan Mika. Tonu. He's been obviously instructed to have a few goes to tie in that uh, Otago loose forward trio. We'll see what he does this time. And it's a penalty. Timmins protests to the referee that it was out. Well, he came in from the side. Safely through, and Cashmore puts Auckland into the lead Cashmore. by Auckland six to five, six, and Otago it's 25 five. minutes gone, first half. Extensiveness to Jones. Tonu. Spencer. Good run by Carlos Spencer. Somebody's down near halfway. Another good run by Mika. Cashmore is there. A Ronnie Clark. And this is getting dangerous now. And a good work by Craig Dowd heading to the corner. Corner flag there to the right. Another good strong hook and charge. Yes, and it's that man, Namu, down there. So he may have a cop something in the ribs. who scores the try straight off the end of the line out and the young flanker Dylan Mika puts Auckland further into the lead yes let's look at the fingertips of Joseph he just tips it deflects it Mika over he goes Well, that's a throw by Oliver was straight down his team's side, and Zinzan Brook has gone through and got it. Tonu'u, away to Mika, the young Marist player from Auckland. And now Tonu'u from Ponsonby, the champion club team. They beat the Marist side in the final is Sotutu. It's a good start in the second half. Michael Jones from out in the west. He's a Westy in Auckland as the rain comes in at Carisbrook and uh, it's a lovely run by Spencer and a lovely pass to Satutu and a pretty good beginning to the second half because Auckland have driven in and have scored a try and it's big Olo Brown who's got that first try. The rain is lashing down some very good skillful play by Auckland in the lead up and Olo Brown finished it off. A lovely pass off to Satutu and a very a strong one. He was the first division player of the year, you remember, last year. And he set it up and in comes big Olo Max Brown 
and he drives hard for the line, keeps it up nicely, and that's a well-taken try by the big prop, Olo Brown. Attacking Auckland scrum, they lead by 20 to 8, 15 minutes gone for a second half. Mika up to Tonu'u, Carlos Spencer. Almo has uh, done some good things in the second half. Maybe there was a case to be switching it, moving it on there. And now Stensness. There's the goal line just ahead. This is good play by Auckland. Spencer to Brook to Jones. And Michael Jones knows how to do it. And that's a try for Auckland's star number seven, Michael Jones. Well, the, the Auckland side are getting in behind the Otago defence here. Too many numbers. Players moving onto the ball. Spencer to Brook. Brook then with the unmarked Jones outside. Jones the pass just slightly behind him. Leslie coming across. But Jones in the corner. Forster. Basham. John Leslie. Overpass Brown to right. Jason Wright, a good step. And maybe Michael Jones was early on Trump foul. Yes, definitely, Keith. Michael Jones took Trump foul out of play there without the ball. Referee saw it. They're going for the seven pointers, though. They want the try and the conversion. Nick Moore is close. Oliver is pushing hard. Otago. Desperate, down by 17, move it wide. Advantage has been played for offside. Brown! Tony Brown scores the try. Yes, looking at it again, the referee was playing advantage here for offside, right along this piece of action. And we might be getting to the point where there's a few uh, professional fouls coming in. But here's Tony Brown, strong bit for the line, and you'll see him roll it over and swing his arms around this way and get it down. Right. He's got a good step inside. Joseph, a good pass under. Randall trying to break clear. A wrapping up part tackled by Stensness. An advantage for Otago. An attack kick taken. Otago trying desperately to break out. Oliver, Joseph, who's got lovely ball skills, hasn't he? Now it's 60 minutes out. Another penalty for Auckland, and I think uh, Otago might be on the receiving end of some professional fouls this week, unlike last week. Randall, a lovely run by the fly, number eight, and he's given it to Wright, and it's a second try. Otago, two tries in a row now. They're back in the game. Time is ticking away, though. Time did kick away, tick away, and despite this last-minute penalty by Tony Brown, Auckland winning once again. For those of you who know very little about rugby, then panicky not because we're going back to basics to find out all about the game. So what is the front row? It consists of a tight head prop, a loose head prop, and a hooker. What's this script? And here we have a rare species of a hunky loose head. And the loose head prop wears shirt number one. <laughs> You've got lovely hair. <laughs> the loose head stands next to the hooker in the scrum and helps prop him up. Usual physical requirements that he be at least three stone overweight, but that's not the case with you, Christian, is it? Certainly not. And he's got one heck of a job to do. Not only does he have to get under the opposing tight head in the scrum situation and lift him up, 
but he's also got to hold up the scrum to enable the hooker to do his job more easily. And on top of that, he's got to drive the opposition back. Hang on, there's the line out as well, isn't it? Yeah? And the line out. The loose head stands in the front of the line out and helps support the jumper. Okay, Christian, up we go. Whoa! Woo! That's <laughs> going strong. <laughs> Christian Loder is the Welsh loosehead prop at present with his debut in South Africa last Saturday. Well done. And Charlie Faulkner is the most famous Welsh loosehead prop. Bennett, that elusive little run. JJ Williams, a bit of room to move. Wins are in support. Is he going to score like he did against Australia? It could be a tie for Faulkner. Misinterpretation will be with us uh, again. Well, now we've seen some terrific matches. Uh, that fantastic uh, Otago Auckland game. And Clive is with us. Clive Jones from Chalky. Bad luck yesterday, Clive. Uh, yes. Yeah, but <laughs> but now, Clive, we, we we know that Southern Hemisphere rugby is is attractive. It's an attractive game. They package it well. They do everything like that. We've got a bonus point system now in Wales. Is, is it a good system? Well, yes, but only if. Play, uh, teams are rewarded for trying to play positive rugby, for trying to keep the ball alive. We all know that it's second phase ball, that is ruck and, and maul ball, that, that you attack disorganised defences off, and that's the type of ball that we've got to produce. But unfortunately in this country, that's the type of ball that too often gets mm. killed or stepped in or spoilt, and so the ball isn't in play. Mm. We'll, uh, we'll show you some examples now mm. of, of this season where we're all expecting from the World Cup good, exciting rugby and we show where teams are not rewarded for trying. Cardiff, you, instead of kicking a ball, are trying to drive it forward, and straight away you see the punt of Preeth forwards join in from the side. Number one penalty, they're offside. Worse than that, they come around and stay there. The ball is bottled up. Chalky, take a ball, drive in through the line-out, drive forward powerfully. Going forward has breached the defence. Three Swansea players offside, not retreating. Chalky continue the attack, the ball is popped up, they are still in offside position, down, the ball is released quickly, and there you can see Keith Colcroft clearly offside, steps in for the ball, and unbelievably, the referee got his arms up saying that's OK, play on. So it's, what you are saying as well, Clive, it's more the responsibility, because you pointed the referee there, more the responsibility of the referees than it is uh, the coaches. Well, obviously, if we want to see attractive rugby, then we've, that type of thing is... is is going to kill it. We, mm. they, you've got to be rewarded for trying mm. to play an expansive game. So when you take the ball in, the onus has got to be on the referee to stop people killing the ball. Otherwise, we are going to see boring rugby. Mm. Three or four games, mm. sides are going to realise that the best thing to do is not risk the ball taking it in there, kick it down to the 22, and let's play safe rugby down there. It's, it's boring, mm. but it's effective, and that's not what we want to see if we want the crowds in. It's breaking continuity, isn't it? Absolutely. Definitely, and it has been the curse of Welsh rugby, and unfortunately, too often, yesterday, we saw exactly the same mm. thing. The ball is in play 22 minutes out of 80 mm. in, in our game. Well, that's just not good enough to market it in a professional sport. Well, it contrasts it so much, doesn't it, with, with the game we saw there, Auckland against Otago, where the continuity, well, it's just terrific, isn't it? Well, we saw some, you know, perfect examples of mm. what can be done. You can see here, this is, we've come from a line-out, we've already had one ruck, they're in to another, the ball is released again. Continue, so we're on to ruck two. Mm. Ruck, the ball comes out, taken back in. You can see no players, no players on the floor, nobody standing in offside positions. The ball is freed again, taken in a superb clear year by the, by the number six from Auckland. Ball released again, back like an egg. <laughs> and remember now, this is played in soaking wet conditions, a superb flipping. Winger goes down, so let's not moan about our conditions. Picked up on the dry and over. You know, mm. the result, an excellent try. And through all that, do notice the size of the crowd. Yeah, terrific crowd, terrific rugby. Now, is that the model that we've got to follow in Wales, that rugby? Well, most definitely we must learn from that. But it's not all doom and gloom yeah. in Wales. You know, we saw some good examples uh, yesterday mm. of some good rugby. And if we show the, uh, the, the next clip, Cardiff Scrum, Amy Taylor drives forward powerfully here. Good support, the ball is released quickly, popped up to Andy Lewis. Good ruck, ball released again, popped through, sucking in the point of three defence now. They're under pressure, out wide, do they stay, do they go? Gap emerges, Adrian spots it, puts it through. Terrific try, as long as the ball is allowed to come back. Mm. What you're saying then, Clive, is that, I mean, we see clips like that, the players are in Wales to play that rugby. 
Well, yeah, everybody wants... <laughs> don't tell me these players go on the field and they, they want to play board in rugby. You're a product of the environment you play in. Mm. And unfortunately, players are rewarded in this country for stopping the ball. Mm. It's second phase mm. ball we have to see if mm. we want to see attractive mm. rugby. And that isn't happening. Mm. OK, recap then. Well, to me, if, if we don't get it sorted out, then the three, the three major points is we're going to have slow ball, we're going to have... Uh, a first phase dominated game. We are going to lose spectators, and if you lose spectators, you're going to lose sponsors. If you lose sponsors, you're going to lose money. It's not going to be in the game. We must solve it. I would solve it personally by anybody okay. who kills a ball. I would put them in a sin bin for 10 minutes. Lovely. Thanks very much, Clive. We'll look forward to seeing you uh, next week. Well, if you're a tourist, South Africa is a fairly impressive country to visit. If you're a Welsh international, you might like to give the country a miss for a while. First the World Cup, then a short revisit. Not the best memories. But those dramatic final moments can only mask the despair being felt at a World Cup campaign that started with sackings and recriminations and ended with this saddest of all exits. Was the spirit in the camp not too good for the World Cup? Yeah. Um, we were under a lot of pressure, and I think it told on uh, certain parts of the squad. It wasn't as um, wasn't as tight as uh, our squad this time, really. You know, everybody was pulling in the same direction. I'm not quite sure everybody was in the World Cup. Oh, it was it was devastating that we didn't make the quarterfinals. You know, uh, things things didn't go to plan in the game, as everybody knows. You know, we trained to play uh, a fairly open type game, and things got uh, rather tight. I think we went 14 points down after 10 minutes, which, you know, in international rugby, you just don't come back from. This return to Alice Park didn't quite turn out to be the nightmare that was once feared. Better Welsh teams than this have lost by larger margins. At least some self-respect has been restored. You know, I was uh, very pleased with the commitment that the boys showed. You know, there was 521 players playing there. You know, and to go out there and play like they did was outstanding. But for, I think, 60 minutes, I thought, you know, we were well in the game. You know, barring a couple of injuries, you know, I think we could have gone, gone a lot, lot better. But, uh, you know, I was pleased with the 60 minutes. But the last 20, I think the altitude got to us and a lack of match fitness, which uh, we knew would happen. And we were just a bit disappointed to let them score three tries at the end there. Ball retention, sometimes we're, we're a bit lax. Uh, and concentration, you know, for 20 minutes against South Africa, we, we lost our concentration. And to lose concentration against any side in the world, then you're going to concede points. That's something that... Uh, we intend to remedy. The last 10 years we have tend to lack flair, but I think you can look back to the league structures where everything is based on two points. And if you don't try things in, in league games week in, week out, then you're not going to try them in international rugby. We hope to become successful and demand the type of money that other clubs at the other sides are on. You know, England has been successful now for five to six years. We hope to, to get up to that sort of standard and demand that sort of money. A few bumps and bruises, but a bit of a result on Saturday, National League Division 13. Cash, please. Apparently, the green, green grass of Wales is now awash with the green, green notes of the Bank of England. In all the time it took for two Australian media barons, Mr Rupert Murdoch and Mr Kerry Packer, to frighten the Southern Hemisphere into signing a contract, rugby went professional. And something that was all once done for absolutely nothing is now just full of investment potential. Rugby in the fast lane. It's gone from the age of the horse and cart driven by Victorians and their amateurism to this. Brum, brum. European Cups, the arms part to be redeveloped for 100 million. The spring box and 140 grand a man. No more dodgy envelopes, all taxes sorted out, fully comprehensive insurance. We'll take it, and I'll pay cash. One's own label. Here's to the fruits of rugby labour. But there must be a snag. The Springboks will be rich, but basically they've signed away their freedom. They'll play as many games as Louis Late deems profitable. Professional players, rugby slaves, and they're the best. What about Wales? If it's all about performance-related pay, what is Welsh rugby worth right now? I know you, you're rubbish you are, now get off my land! The staff nowadays, next he'll be wanting a minimum wage. 
The person to talk to about a wage in rugby should be sitting here in our hot seat, the new Scrum 5 debating chamber. Vernon Pugh, though, is a busy man, so fear not, we got him this morning. A little exclusive for Scrum, Fies, Scrum 5, and I asked Vernon Pugh if he was surprised by the speed of change. It, it was amazing, I think, when one looks back upon it. I didn't anticipate it even two days before the meeting. And certainly now, uh, I think one can see the beginnings of um, concern on the part of uh, those who are part of the decision as to whether or not they did the right thing. I'm pretty sure that they did. But uh, yes, I think it is momentous and pretty historic. If two days before the meeting you were heading for presumably another fudge, what happened to make everybody change their mind? I chaired the meeting and uh, decided quite deliberately that uh, if we talked in the abstract about what the game should be and what should happen, we'd get nowhere. We would certainly fudge. And we had uh, an honesty session. Really, we went around the table and uh, asked people to state in fairly plain terms what was happening in each union. And the result was quite incredible. Um, from countries that uh, you would know have always been in position of paying for playing. But the extent to which it was exposed was, um, for example, in France, absolutely breathtaking. And I think that uh, really set the tone for it. You know, once we'd gone round, 12 countries there, of the 12 countries, seven or eight, effectively uh, professional in one sense or another. And there was no turning back from that. It was then a case of uh, trying to make it fit together and understanding that uh, the sham couldn't continue. The game has gone open, and the game in Europe is still way behind the Southern Hemisphere. Is there a link between <coughs> money and, and rugby philosophy, or, or do you think now we've, we've got the, the issue of DOSH out in the open, all we've got to do now is make sure we play the game properly? I'm not sure I'd go along with the premise, uh, first of all. I know it's fairly fashionable to say now that uh, Southern Hemisphere are way ahead of us. But when you think back to World Cup, it was only a matter of, what, six or ten inches, which would have meant that France would have been in the final and not South Africa. So while there is a gulf, I don't think it's an absolutely um, incredible one. Um, what is happening is that uh, they've changed their style of play to suit uh, a game which is open, professional, but which is entertaining. And I think that's what we've got to do, is to uh, accept that uh, in a professional world, the game has to entertain. So you've sorted out the world issue, and now perhaps Wales next. Is that because Wales is more difficult? Um, there's nothing closer to my heart than uh, getting Wales right. Uh, but it is difficult getting Wales right, because uh, we are in a period of um, fairly long-term decline. It's not a game which has gone uh, suddenly wrong in Wales. It's a slippery slope that we've been going down quietly but gradually for probably 15 years. And arresting that is... Um, not that easy because first of all it takes uh, a recognition that we are going downhill and not this belief that you sometimes have in Wales that uh, we can turn it around very easily, that we've got the players, there's no real problem, things will come right. If you and the club seem to be heading in the same direction, they've gone and formed this limited company, how, how do you react to that? Well I'm disappointed with some of the things which have emerged from the senior clubs. Uh, last year we established a dialogue with those clubs, I, I thought it was quite an effective way forward that we were discussing with our top 12 clubs as at that time, because it's a movable feast, uh, it's a meritocracy, and uh, it will be a different 12 clubs next year, and perhaps different shareholders in their limited company, because there must be a way back for clubs like Pontypool, who are great clubs, and for them to be excluded from this um, special group is quite wrong. But when you look at uh, what emerged from the clubs this week, namely dissatisfaction at, for example, the uh, points for tries rule, well, that does concern me because um, that seems to indicate a, a lack of understanding that our game had to move forward, that it had to become a game where more movement, more excitement, and an emphasis upon uh, the ball being spread around. And for them to say that uh, that was unacceptable, I think, is a fairly negative attitude. And I hope that it is only something connected to the fit of peak as opposed to a, a substantive view. Finally, we've got 220 clubs. That's a lot of committee men. Can they vote for change as quickly as you'd like them to? It is now a rugby business, certainly at the top level, and the union and uh, the top clubs will have to be run like a business, otherwise uh, we will fall behind. And we have many things to do, and one of the things we have to do is to devolve more power. The union tries to do far too much. Um, it tries to administer the game from the top all the way down to the bottom, whereas what we should be really doing is giving more responsibility to 
for example, the districts and the clubs below, let them have their own fate in their own hands because there are some very good people out in the clubs, whether they be in Division 6, 7 or 8, quality people who should be given responsibility. And I think that may be the way forward for us, is that we become leaner at the top and uh, much more fighting fit and responsible with money to back it at the lower end. The main man on the way ahead, the view from the top. But what about you lot? What do you think about changes in rugby, the state of the Welsh game? Scrum 5, never shy of getting out and about, has been to see the punters. The best thing is that, uh, that has happened to body goal professional is that he's now honest. The hypocrisy has gone out of the window. Uh, it is an honest game. The players have been paid in Wales. Uh, they have received all kinds of bonuses in England. Now it's all out in the open, and it's the best thing that has happened. And they went professional, what, two weeks ago? You can't really decide that it's actually happened so soon. It's going to take a couple of years, I think, for really to take part. Um, I think you see a lot of small clubs with good players coming up. Um, there'll also be, in, there'll be incentives there for them to play for the big clubs. It's going to take a few years. One point that came out of the game, Wales really have to look at the outside half position. Uh, Neil Jenkins' performance last week for South Africa and his performance today revealed, as we all know, that he is an excellent kicker, perhaps one of the best kickers that Wales has ever seen. But as a footballer, I'm afraid a lot is required and if I had anything to do with selection, which I know I don't, the man I would go for would be Alec Williams. It's good to be positive from last weekend. Um, it was a very gutsy performance. A lot of positive points came out of the performance. Uh, we've got to stick with the team and we've got to develop the team for the future. Well, we've got to improve. I mean, there's no point in trying to say that we're good players just on, the st on club rugby. We've got to commit pitch ourselves against English and French teams and South African teams. We've got to improve the general standard. I think we've got too many teams in the first division. We've got to cut it down so that the best teams are playing each other week in, week out, and then mixing that with good standard of international club rugby. Before we do that, we're not going to have a decent Welsh side. And that's about it. Final word from Eddie. Good bonus point system? Bonus points, bonus pounds, modern rugby. Well, Cardiff's bonus this uh, weekend was Steve Ford and the youngsters at Cardiff. They love him. Bye-bye. Bye. So who's your favourite player? Steve Ford. Why is that? Because he scored three tries to take.